Eh, vale, vamos a comenzar con, con este evento, que es una de las charlas que tenemos programadas dentro de lo que es el, el centenario del nacimiento de, de Turing. Sabéis que ya hemos hecho algunos, algunos actos, algunas conferencias relacionadas con la vida de Turing. Eh, también el concurso de, de criptografía, bueno, una serie de eventos que vamos realizando a lo largo del, del curso. Y, y este es otro de ellos, ¿vale? Es una... Una, una charla que va a impartir el profesor José Hernández Zorallo, ¿vale? que bueno, creo que muchos de los que estáis aquí ya lo conocéis porque es compañero nuestro, es profesor del Departamento de Sistemas Informáticos y Computación y es profesor de, de, la, de la escuela, entonces algunos pues, lo habéis tenido de, de profesor probablemente. Eh, José eh, trabaja en, en el grupo de, de extensiones de la programación lógica del Departamento de Sistemas Informáticos y Computación y bueno, su ámbito de trabajo es, va desde la programación lógica, el aprendizaje automático, eh, los sistemas de información y, y la inteligencia artificial. Abarcar <ríe> un montón de, de aspectos. En, en, en lo que es la escuela, él imparte pues, docencia relacionada con las bases de datos y con la minería de datos, ¿no? si no me equivoco. ¿vale? Y, y bueno, pues a continuación nos va a impartir esta, esta charla. Eh, la charla se imparte en, en inglés porque forma parte también de lo que son las actividades que giran en torno al grupo ARA, al grupo de, de alto rendimiento académico. Y, y bueno, pues se va a impartir en inglés. Cuando quieras, puedes comenzar. Well, first of all, thanks to the school for this invitation. It's a pleasure to be uh, able to talk about uh, an area of research that I, oh, I'm very fond of this area of research. And I would, I would say that I'm passionate about this area of research. And that means that perhaps my talk is going to be very personal, so very subjective. So I please uh, apologize for that, because this is not an aseptic or uh, uh, an objective uh, view of how machine intelligence evaluation has evolved uh, along the last or the past six which is a long time. And this is especially so because I've been involved in, in this area in the past 15 years or so intermittently as well. So I, I have to do other things because this is not a mainstream area of research. So first of all, this is in the, in the context of in the context of the Alan Turing year. So uh, I guess that most of you know who uh, Alan Turing was and his contributions. And perhaps without him, of course, uh, we, we, we wouldn't be here at this moment. And some people say that um, the world uh, would be very different if uh, Turing hadn't done all the contribution that he did. And I, use, I like to think that the, the world would be much more different had he lived longer, because he died very young. So well, I think that from all these, um, from all these uh, celebrations, I think the, the sweetest of them all is this celebration that uh, my friend and collaborator, David Dow, did. Uh, some weeks ago at Varnash University, they just, he designed a, a cake. And I'm not sure you're going to see all the details about the cake, the design. But here we can see some of the contributions by Alan Turing. And probably uh, the, the most famous contribution is his um, Turing machine, the notion of Turing machine, and of course the notion of universal Turing machine. This is uh, Stace. Uh, space or, uh, of a single uh, Turing machine. Here we can see this um, cryptographic thing, which is a kind of, of old thing. No, it's not the Enigma machine, that, um, but it reflects his works on cryptography and his efforts during the uh, Second World War. And here we see a cow. Why we see a cow there? Well, the cow is represented more for Genesis. And this is a, a, an area of research by Alan Turing that perhaps in computer science 
we don't emphasize uh, enough. But it is related to computer science because it tries to exploit it. It's an area of chemistry or biology nowadays. But it, it tries to explain why we see some patterns on skins or fur of animals or any other uh, biological system. So these patterns, how do generate from genes, for instance. So this area, which is called morphogenesis, was also, or he's also the father of this area of research. And finally, and we are going to start from here today, we see an iconic representation of the Turing test, where we see a computer, a machine, sorry, a computer, human, and an integrator who is also a human. This is just a very iconic implication of the Turing test. We are going to start from there. So, well, so I think that this is one important contribution. Not only this uh, test that we are going to talk about, or at least for uh, the first part of, of the talk, but also this idea of machines thinking, okay, which is what this uh, original paper where the Turing test was or the imitation game was introduced at Delta Power. So this is the outline of the talk. You can see Turing several times here, not only because of uh, the Turing test, but in fact, more frequently because of the notion of universal Turing machine, and we will see why. So let's start with the main idea of this talk. Well, we are talking about measuring, evaluating machines. Why is it important? Well, we know what artificial intelligence is. It deals, sorry, it deals with the construction of intelligent machines. And I put an emphasis here on the construction. Well, and what about measuring them? Is it the heart of any discipline? If you don't, if you're not able to measure things, you cannot progress in that discipline. So, well, this is at the roots of science, measuring. And disciplines progress so you are, when you are able to evaluate the progress of that discipline. Okay, so measuring is important. And of course, in science, we, we, we do distinctions, equivalences, degrees, scales, taxonomies, and all of these things are, uh, very frequently, they are just performed using measures. Just, let's put an example. Aeronautics, for instance. How do these people uh, evaluate things? Well, they construct airplanes. But what are the measurements there? Well, they have a lot of measures about mass, speed, altitude, time, consumption, low, wingspan, and many, many, many others. And according to these measures, they can just make a taxonomy and they can evaluate how they progress. And they can even uh, put different kinds of machines in different categories according to these measurements. Are we able to do the same thing in artificial intelligence? Well, this is one of the questions that we are going to, 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 to discuss during this, this talk. So, the first thing, what are we measuring? Or what we would like to measure here? Algorithms, just algorithms, which is the same as talking about Turing machines or universal two machines, or something more physical, or more resource, less ideal, something like a resource bounded machine, or a physical machine, interactive, non-interactive, in, in the actual world, robotics, in the virtual world, in the internet, where do we want to measure all these things? With sensors and activators, without them? Well, we have a very broad spectrum. So, this is what we have. Sorry. Yeah. Well, and probably you can add more pictures here. And we can all the with them. Well, we can say, oh, this is very, very fun. This is, oh, look at this assistant. It is helpful. But not in terms of intelligence, especially because People are used to hear things like smartphones, intelligent fridges, things like that, which makes completely no sense. So we are overusing the word intelligence, so it is very difficult to assess 
uh, the intelligence of all these artifacts. So, well, let's go to the point. What are the uh, instruments that we have nowadays to evaluate machine intelligence? Well, the answer is quite discouraging. No, there's almost nothing. Nothing practical, general. There are many, many things, but not, nothing that you can say, okay, give me a system, I'm going to evaluate that. No, 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 no. This doesn't work this way, at least at this moment. Okay? So, um, that I, I can think about many reasons. I'm not sure of the answer why the current state of affairs is broken. No, well, not broken. Okay. Um, one reason is that we don't have intelligent machines. So, since we don't have them, there's no need to measure them. So, forget about this problem. It will come. But well, this is a bad perspective for science. Just wait until the problem appears. Well, this might be the reason uh, several years ago, but, well, uh, this moment is uh, approaching, I would say. Another reason is that AI has been defined many times as a science related to humans or in an anthropocentric point of view. So we have that um, this definition, this famous or infamous definition about AIs is the science of making machines do things that will require intelligence if done by humans. Just think about aeronautics, for instance, with this definition. Aeronautics is the science of making airplanes uh, or things that would require flying abilities if done by birds. No way to advance in aeronautics with that definition. Okay? So, if we would take birds as a reference, that's what the, the people trying to fly in the Middle Ages did, well, we would still not, uh, we, we, we didn't, we, we didn't have, we didn't have um, uh, planes at the moment. Well, I think that, that well, these might be uh, partial answers to that, but I think that the main reason is this is a very complex problem. That's the main reason, okay? Because, well, I can say why this is not interesting. That's not true. That question is interesting. And all these people would like to have an answer for that, and we don't have an answer for that. So let's start from the beginning. Right? It's not really the beginning, but many people consider this as the beginning of machine intelligence measurement. Well, probably you've heard about uh, Turing's 1950 paper, which is called Computer Machinery Intelligence. Machinery is not a word which is very common nowadays. So computer machines and intelligence, or just machines and intelligence. And just look at the time. There are many, many people, there were many, many people at that time that didn't believe that machines could think. Probably how many of you how many of you think the machines can think in the future? Can you raise your hands? And how many of you, of course you, you, that, that might be abstentious, how many of you machines will never think? Okay, probably this question or the, the, the positions were quite different 60 years ago. Probably there were more raising hands against machine thinking in the future than there are today, but there are still people thinking that this is not possible. And until we are able to prove that, well, they have uh, that position, okay? Well, it is my opinion that when he said that this question is too meaningless to deserve discussion, it's because he thought that machines will think. In fact, the paper is full about objections against people uh, uh, or against, against positions saying that machines can't think. One idea I like to push forward whenever we think about thinking, let me just uh, uh, forgive the repetition, is what about collectives, for instance? Is there intelligence in this room? Probably there are some. Okay? And what about, is this room thinking? 
well, not as a single entity. Is this room conscious? Well, I think he's referring to that. This is a meaningless question. The question is, is there some intelligence in this room? And this is a question. This is a good question. Okay? Let's take a problem, come in through the door, and just come together, everyone, and try to solve that problem. If we are able to solve that problem, we show we are intelligent. But the different problem, the different issues, whether we are thinking together separately or whatever. So the good question is, is there some intelligence here? Which degree, which capabilities? This is the, the, the good question. And probably this paper is very well known because of the Turing test, but I think that the most interesting thing of the paper is his nine answers to the objections about non or machines uh, um, or the impossibility of machines uh, being intelligent. So there are some objections. So you, probably some of you who have said no, because one of them. I don't think that anyone here could believe all of them. Okay, but at that time there were many people. Even the God objection or the machines are too dangerous to consider that eventually they're going to be intelligent, or they don't have feelings, they don't have humor, and all of that. Or they will never have feelings, they will never have humor, and all of that. And that's an important one. I think this is um, the loveless objections and machines are programmed, and they, they will never do anything on their own. Well. I could have that objection for humans sometimes as well. And there's another one which is um, interesting, extrasensory perception. Oh, no, come on. Well, it's not talking about parapsychology and all of that. This is talking about, well, the, the brain, there may be some quantum computation we are not able to, to grasp at the moment. And there have been very important people just taken this argument or related arguments. So, well, the thing is, it's still a uh, um, controversial issue. You can have your opinion, I have your, my opinion, but it's still an opinion. Well, so he also, in this paper, he, he also introduced an imitation game. And you heard about that. Not as it was originally, it was a machine, a woman, and a human integrator. And I don't know if the, the, the fact that he was gay has something to do with the issue that the test was about men and women. Okay, so wow, there has been some uh, discussion about this. Um, we will never know. But the common understanding of the imitation game is what we, know, we call the Turing test. Uh, Turing didn't use the word test for that, okay? He always was talking about a game. And it was just before these objections. So he didn't propose that as a test for intelligence, just as aim, just to be helpful to answer these questions. Well, uh, okay, it is understood as a tune test, and how, how does it go? Well, we have a machine here, a human and a human integrator. And the goal is through a telepathic, uh, telepathic communication at that time, just um, the terminal, something that you can't see the faces or anything else. But the, um, the robot or the machine tries to, uh, to be or to present to be uh, a human. So the integrator must tell uh, who is who in this picture which is not easy because you're just seeing the, the conversation. Well, is it a test? Why people, why do people call it a test? Well, it has many problems as a test, especially as intelligence test. But it is not a test of intelligence, it's a test of humanity. It is a different thing, okay? Uh, it is relative to human characteristics, it's not gradual. You can say, okay, it passed the test, well, you can give a score, it's not really clear what to do with it. It is human intervention. We need an interrogator. We need to train the interrogator. So it's not just take just a random human, put that as an interrogator, and it works. No, you have to train the interrogator first. It typically takes too much time. 
to tell, especially to, to tell humans and machine apart. It is anthropocentric. They are humans a couple of times here. One as one subject and the other as interrogator. I think this is the most uh, important problem. We need a human interrogator. This, this cannot be an automated, for instance. And well, the main problem, uh, the main fundamental problem is not a sufficient condition and it's not a necessary condition. We may have intelligent things which do not pass a test and we can have, uh, and the other way around. Okay? So we have. Uh, these two problems. Turing is not to be blamed by this. He never meant this as a measurement tool for artificial intelligence. It was just an argument in a discussion. Okay? And I like to say that this has had a negative impact in the measurement of um, artificial intelligence, or the evaluation of artificial intelligence. And the point is that if Turing said or invented the Turing test, because this has to be the solution. First, the Turing test didn't propose it as a solution. So don't take that as the answer. He didn't mean that in, at any moment. So this has had a negative. Uh, in fact, there have been many and many discussions about the Turing test in the philosophy of artificial intelligence with Probably uh, this has worked as a negative or as a, a um, kind of uh, blocking thing to, to do real research in machine intelligence measurement. Uh, this is my opinion. So let's take a look at one incarnation of the Turing test. Uh, there's a... Um, uh, uh, a prize organized every year, at least uh, for the past 20 years or more, or more. It is called the Leibniz Prize, and they do it every year. And here's a, an example of a transcript between J and P. You follow the conversation, it is a very natural conversation. One is a human, and the other one is a machine. I could have uh, shown much more interesting conversation where you can spot the machine at the very first line. But, well, I, I just try to uh, show an example where it is difficult to find which is a machine and which is the, the human. In this case, J is a human, but it is a human judge, and P is a pro. Well, the judge is asking and the program is answering those questions. Probably this went very nice because, very nicely because, well, probably the machine was expecting or was pre-programmed to these kind of questions. This program wasn't intelligent. So we have the standard Turing test. The Lopner Prize is one of uh, its or its implementations. It is becoming more difficult for the uh, interrogators, for the judges. And we've seen a lot of variants. There's something called the total Turing test, visual Turing test, where we include sensory information. So, oh, as, um, a telepathic communication is quite restricted. You will never grasp the concept of intelligence if you can't see faces and all of that. What about blind people? Yeah, we, they are very happy with a, a, a Turing test implementation. Okay. So think, well, these are just variants, but they don't try to add anything uh, special here. So, well, this is more or less uh, the start of our story, Turing test. And let's see how artificial intelligence has been performing along the years. And I've called this section Kapsin up, and we will see why in a moment. Well, Probably this is approximately, and if some of you are working on any of these areas, you can say, oh, this is not exactly that date, or, well, I'm just trying to put something that whenever I consider that um, a task is performed at least as well in general conditions by machines. So things are changing quite rapidly. In, originally, people said that uh, calculation was 
was a feature of humans that showed uh, intelligent behavior. And, w and whenever machines started to calculate better than humans, they said, no, no, calculation is not part of it, because machines can do that. Okay? So that was well, cryptography. No, 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 cryptography. Ah, oh, well, this is a variant of calculation. Well, simple games. No, no, no. Machine will never win a test championship. They did. Well, you can add things to the list. In fact, there's something here, IQ test. I will talk about that in a moment. So do we have measurement tools for these areas? Yes, we have. We have a lot of contests, competitions, but specialized, specialized tests. So we have things such as Robocop. Probably you hear there's a team here in the university playing Robocop. Oh, I think they are, or they have some kind of robot, some pictures or something. And there's, for instance, driverless uh, cars and the general game competition. There are many, many competitions about specific domains. And each year or each several years, they do this competition and they say, oh, this is the best machine for doing this. Well, this is much in the line of a notion that I would like to stand out, even that it has had uh, it, it hasn't had a, 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 a very important uh, impact in in this. But Zade, perhaps some of you know Zade because he's a other fuzzy system, fuzzy sets, something that perhaps most of you don't know. Well, he's an important, a very well known. Uh, researcher, and he introduced the notion of machine intelligence quotient in 1976. And these words came later, but he is he himself talking about MIQ. MIQ is relative, about product specific, about specific things such as this one. And well, it, he puts an example about cameras. I wouldn't talk about cameras when I'm referring to intelligence, but well, he just said MIQ just compares the ability of a machine on a specific domain compared to the other machines at that time. Well, this is not really intelligence measurement. This is another thing. But you can call it MIQ, and I think this is a good name because just, just comparing something relative to the population, which is exactly the same thing the IQ for humans does. We are going to see that in a well, and we reached a, a very special moment 10 years ago. Uh, evaluating machines wasn't a uh, hot topic at the moment. But telling humans and machines apart it started to be. There were bots that trying, they were trying to create a lot of accounts in uh, mail, in email systems. So nowadays, whenever you try to create a new account, uh, make a post or whatever, you're typically uh, uh, shown one of these quizzes or things and you have to write something there. Well, these are called captures, okay? And th the name comes from completely automated public Turing test to tell computers and human apart. A brilliant acronym. So they try to with humans, computers, Turing tests, and and I like this automated, automated. This is interesting here. So well, this is quick and practical. It works. Whenever you try to do something, well, you, you you just get this, and you have to write. Why are they using distorted characters many of the time? There are variants for uh, disabled people. There are variants that they don't use these distorted characters. But why they are using? Why are they using distorted characters? This is the answer. Where is it? Printed non-distorted. Sorry. It's too too close together for my finger. Um. Uh, printed character recognition. It was a problem some years ago. But distorted character recognition is a more difficult thing. So using that because machines can't do that. That's the reason why. And humans can do that very easily. That's the reason. So it is easy to tell them apart because 
at least for this ability, they are very different at the moment. Okay? Well, but if you look at the list, you quickly realize that distorted characters are not going to be there forever. In fact, you can download applications that pass these captures. And you can create a lot of accounts and things. Uh, they fail eventually, but if they uh, uh, succeed half of the time, they are perfectly useful. Okay? So, captures are becoming more and more complex because they need to uh, defend against these uh, bots and programs trying to, uh, to crack them. So it is clear the captures will become obsolete in the future, or they will need to change very frequently. In the end, they are not conceived as tools to measure intelligence. They're just a current state of technology. We use them to tell humans from machines. That's the use that we have for them. OK? In fact, there's a, is there a correlation between intelligence and the task that AI is able to solve, there might be some, but it's not a very clear correlation. If you look at things that are challenging for AI, speech recognition, distorted character recognition, musical abilities, navigation, summarization, of course, natural language. Uh, but some of them, natural language will be a good example, but some of them are performed equally well by almost all humans. So they don't show any difference in intelligence. People who are very intelligent, they don't typically recognize distorted characters better than the rest of the people. So they are not intelligent tasks. So some of the tasks where artificial intelligence is facing the, the, the problems are not really that intelligent. Some others are, like natural language is one of the, the most challenging and probably one that requires intelligence. But there's no correlation in many of them. So it is not clear that a difficult task for AI is a task that requires intelligence. In the end, can we answer this question? Are AI artifacts artifact today more intelligent than they were 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago? They are much better, more practical, they can solve more things. Are they more intelligent? I think we can't answer that question. There's, well, we can, but we can't answer that in a principal way or uh, with some uh, scientific background behind. Well, so let's move a little bit further from that. So let's take a look at human intelligence. And probably all of you have uh, eventually done an IQ test or something like that at school or maybe later. Um, they were developed in the last part of the 19th century, first half of uh, 20th century. There was an important notion that they tried to be culture fair instead of culture bound. Uh, they, they, they were trying to uh, spot out idiot savant. And, well, there's a lot of things here. I'm not going to... Um, go into the details, but probably you heard about the IQ, and this is something that we're used to, and we're using to evaluate humans. And I don't know if you know these details, but typically what we do in IQ uh, uh, test is just to uh, use a test, get the results, and normalize the result. We put the mean of a normal distribution at 100, and a standard deviation of 15. So whenever you get 150, that means that you take a normal distribution, you find where 150 is with these parameters, you're going to know how many people you are above of, okay? Percentage of people probably, you can say, oh, I'm better than 99% uh, of the population. So this is useful. And this is the way it works. But now that I'm highlighting the word relative again and again, well, Probably you know this as well. There are many factors, memory, inductive abilities, calculation. It's in interesting to relate these abilities with the areas in artificial intelligence because there are some 
there's a parallelism between these factors and different areas in artificial intelligence. Well, you know how, or how tests are, what they do look like, and um, they're used by companies, governments, uh, schools, and there's a lot of controversy about what uh, they represent, but they are still there, they're useful, and people use them. And people believe what these tests say, or oh, they just passed a test to Einstein and scored 160, and we rely on them. Uh, we that some criticism, of course, but, but this is established science. So, well, let's use them for machines. They are there, they work. So why, do, why, I, why, why can't we use them? So, well, this has been suggested many, many, many times from the very inception of artificial intelligence. But, well, very recently, Dirterman, the editor of the Intelligence Journal, which is one of the most important journals in the area of human intelligence, or intelligence in, in general, just um, made a call, a challenge to Watson. I don't know if you know, uh, Watson was uh, the, the founder of IBM, but it's also a system. It's also a program developed by Watson Research, so which is by IBM Research, and this system participated in um, GPT, which is a TV quiz in the United States. And this system was able to beat the humans at this, at this program, this TV program, okay? One of these quizzes that you have to answer questions about general knowledge and all of that. This was a couple of years ago, and there was a lot of fuss about this. Oh, this is a hallmark of artificial intelligence. Well, this it was publicity in the end, but this was a, a very good achievement to do that. It was a, a, a very a nice research behind this. But the talent by the term, well, okay, come with your system, pass some tests to that system. I'm sure that your system is going to score very poorly. And he's, he's right. This system is not prepared to pass uh, intelligence tests, not even an IQ test. But hold on. About 10 years ago, Sangi and Dao implemented a small program, about 1,000 lines of code, in Perl, a third year student project. So, nothing. It is not comparable to. Uh, the money that they invested on Watson. And this system passed a lot of IQ tests. Well, it, it was more or less on average. The idea of this wasn't to show that you can uh, write an intelligent system in 1,000 lines of code. Not at all. The idea was to show that this program is not intelligent. You can write a program which passes IQ tests, and this program is not intelligent. So, well, so you can't use IQ tests for machines. Well, um, this year we tried to write, well, we, we, we wrote a rejoinder to Detterman in the same journal, and we tried to explain, or at least from our point of view, why IQ tests are not for machines. And the, the reason why, the main reason why, is that they are anthropocentric. They take a lot of things for granted, for humans. And you try to use them for machines, this is not working. Because for humans, you have been, along the past century, you have been specializing the IQ tests for humans. So they're just for them. And you take a look at small children and people with disabilities, you realize that IQ tests have to be changed for them. You don't use IQ tests for children. For children, you use a different thing. And the reason why is that they know that. They just specialize for the average human. Okay? Not even any human. So they are very specific, very subject specific, or very species specific. 
Of course, we can devise different IQ tests if you get machines and machines trying to pass these tests, but this would end up as a psychometric capture. So you all, this machine is able to pass this test, estimate the change, the, the test, put a different one. So you can do this and it, iterative thing, but in the end, what you are getting is just a kind of adaptive capture or something. So this is not the way, or at least or something that we said, not yet. Okay? Let's move to the tympocentric point of view. Let's go to animals. I think it's, this is much more interesting. Probably I have to go there. It's not working. Oh. <laughs> Oh, I didn't try this. Uh, probably it's not embedded. And I don't have a copy. It should be embedded. I don't know why. Probably it's the... Okay, I'm sorry. Do you have to this? Okay, let me just summarize what's in these two short videos. Well, the first video is about um, um, a chimpanzee doing some cups problem, where you put some three cups and you, have, you put some uh, reward inside one of the cups. You do something like this, like in, on the street, some people do this, and the chimpanzee is able to take the cup and just uh, take its reward, and everything goes okay. When you go to human children, things become much worse. You do the same thing, and the children is just looking at the, the windows or whatever, and in the end, the, um, the, the child fails. The interesting thing about the animal kingdom and the area called um, comparative psychology is that we can evaluate different species. And this is a very interesting area. In animal evaluation, which is as we use rewards, are very much concerned about interfaces. It's not the same for parrots than an interface for chimps. For instance, we have to change the interface, not only the, the reward that we give, but also the interface must be completely different. And, and there's a lot of study about interfaces, how do we uh, um, design interfaces to each different uh, species? Again, this is called comparative psychology because we compare some species against some other species. We typically do not compare individuals. There are some studies comparing individuals, but they try to compare species. So it is relative again. What's the relation between psychometrics, human evaluation, and animal evaluation? Well, one should be the, a part of the other, but it is not so. It's very different. Psychometrics is quite different, or the techniques that we have quite different to the techniques that we have in animal e evaluation. But this is becoming closer and closer. And there are many, many uh, studies in the past 10 years comparing special, especially children and, and chimpanzees, apes. That's the reason why this area was uh, accused of being chimpocentric. And now we have seen several studies with dolphins and some other animals. Because instead of being uh, anthropocentric, some people started to be chimpocentric. Oh, look at this bonobo. Oh, look what she does and all of that. Well, what about other animals? And they have found uh, exceptional abilities in many other animals. Is it applicable to machines? Our goal. Our goal is to try to find some tests for, uh, for machines. Well, the tasks they are using are not systematic. Some tasks will be very easy for machines. They are not really related to intelligence. Some others will be very difficult, especially those uh, uh, related to orientation, recognition, interaction, 
it's no natural language, typically in, in animals, so this is a good perspective. And there are some things that are very useful, that would be very useful for machines. The notion of reward is very, very interesting for intelligence testing. Also the notion of interface, that you have to adapt to the subject. And the notion of social ability, it is, it's, it's a hot topic in animal evaluation. No prejudices, I think this is a, an important point of view. And also it is not anthropocentric. So you try to explore the animal kingdom, what you find, and not, you don't have any preconception about things. And humans are just special case. If you look at this one, then it's much better if you look with your iPhone and all of that. It is, but, but in that way, it, it's, it's easier to accept that, that we are just a uh, special case. Well, so back to machines. Um, we have, we've been talking about the Turing test and related ideas, captures, which is also related. Is there any approach in artificial intelligence or in computation about intelligence? Of course, there are many. Uh, but they are not based on Turing's 1950 paper, but on 1936 paper, the paper where he introduced the notion of computability, the notions of universal Turing machines, mutability as well. When we are thinking about intelligence, there are some ideas that come up, it's like information, information processing, like inductive inference, inference, perhaps not compression and probability, but these things have been appearing along the years. And if you look at a, a Turing machine, this is a Turing machine in Lego, and where you feed some zeros and ones, and you get some ones and zeros and as output, you think that, well, intelligence has always been seen as information processing, as a kind of information processing, but a very special kind, which we are not able to uh, uh, determine precisely. But, well, many people think that this is just information processing. So let's talk about information processing for a while. Probably all these guys, you know some of them, or perhaps all of them. This one is a steering. This is Shannon. You should know who Shannon was, the father of information theory. And probably you don't know these guys over there. But this is Solomonov, Komorgov, a lot of those there. Chaitin and Wallace and Bolton. Well, the important thing about these people is that they develop the notions of information theory, algorithmic information theory, probability and its relation to information, uh, its relation between inference, statistical inference, learning, and all of that. So, well, let me just get a little bit technical for one slide, okay? Just, just one slide, okay? Well, I don't know if you have heard about all these ideas, but uh, they are not so difficult. Just imagine what's Comor of complexity with that ugly name. Well, Comor of complexity is just the shortest program for an object. So imagine you have a Java interpreter, and you're given a long string by that. And just write a program the shortest that you can to output that string. You just think and think, and in the end you'd write a, uh, three lines, you write a program that outputs that string because you see some patterns in that string and you're able to output that string. That's the common word of complexity. Well, the shortest program that you can write in Java, that's the common of complexity of that object in Java. Okay? It's not a very difficult concept. But we can think this the other way around. Just consider a Java interpreter, or Python, or Perl. I don't, I, I don't care about the language. Or a universal Turing machine, which is the same thing. Well, and just feed characters randomly as a program. Wow, there will be a lot of syntax errors. For, forget about syntax errors for the moment. What's the output? What's the expected output? of that program. Imagine a Turing machine. Turing machine don't have syntax errors. Everything is a program. He feeds everything. It feeds everything. So well, this is the, the distribution of bits that comes out from the, this idea is called the algorithmic probability. And the good point is that these two things are related because these are, so these are related by 
this formula with those of you who know some Shannon's information theory would find very, very, very familiar because it just relates the combat of complexity, the information with the probability. What does all this have to do with intelligence? Well, just one thing before answering that question. Well, in various theorem, it says that, well, look, there's a subindex here, which means, okay, it's not the same. If you want to write a program for that object in Java, the length of your program is not going to be the same length as your program in Python, for instance. Because in Python, you can write that in, in, in fewer lines than in, in, in Java. But there might be some other program, which is the other way around. You can find a shorter program in different language, depending on the specialization of the language. So, well, that depends on the, on the program, on the programming language, on the universal tool machine you're using. So this is a, a, a useless concept. Well, the answer, it is not. It doesn't depend so much on the programming language. As you know, a difficult problem usually requires a lot of lines in any language. This is something that you know, and that's a theorem saying that, because there's always a constant difference between the length of these two programs in two different languages, doing the same thing. This is an important result. This, is, this comes from, from the notion of universal tuning machine. So these two things, they don't depend on the uh, machine you're using behind so much. That's just a constant. This constant can be very great, can be, can be high, but it's not so, so relative. Well, we would say, some people say that this is an absolute measure of information. There are, of course, problems in computability here, but we have approximations. So let's just forget about the formulas and just get the idea, the idea of compression. Okay? You are familiar with the idea of compression, all of you. We use it every day with uh, movies and uh, music and everything. And not only do you know what a zip file is, you're familiar with the notion of compression. So what does all this have to do with intelligence? Well, compression and inductive inf inference are seen as very similar things. When you are able to compress, you're able to see patterns, or you're able to learn, it's because you are able to see patterns. So these two things are related. And if we are able to relate all of this to learning, which is a kind, or inductive inference is a kind of learning, we can say, oh, intelligence must be related as well. So there have been some proposals along these lines. One of the most remarkable is this, develop formal definitions of intelligence and measures of its various components using these theories. Well, there's something that someone had to try, okay? So, there was uh, the first uh, work following these lines uh, was a paper called a computational extension to the Turing test, the Turing test again, where we enriched uh, the Turing test with compression problems. So, problems where you have some kind of uh, if you are able to compress this idea, it's because you're intelligent. So it is not just chattering, chatting against uh, an interrogator, but the exercise will be much more uh, uh, complex problems where you need to show that you are intelligent. So, well, this is the idea where you try to incorporate the notion of compression inside a Turing test. Well, I, I follow more or less the same ideas, and I introduce a definition and test based on algorithm information theory. So what I just uh, try to do is something that you can read here. So, well, I just chose a Turing machine, just a machine. You don't need to use the Turing there. If you don't like it, just a machine. I just used a machine, a, a, a programming language, for instance and an alphabet, and I just try to generate sequences using that language with some properties, and with these sequences, I just calculated the complexity, variant of the common complexity of each sequence. We have that this is uh, difficulty 9, difficulty 12, difficulty uh, 14, and I constructed the test with that. 
And intelligence as a result of a test, just using a lot of exercises of different complexity and just averaging all of that. So nothing special except from the way these sequences are generated and the way the complexity or the difficulty of that of each exercise is uh, assigned. Okay? It is not assigned because people do better here or worse there or the other way around. It's because the complexity, a variant of the common complexity of this string is lower than for the other string. So this can be calculated and at least depending on that machine or on that machine, this is just a number that you can calculate. So well, what's the result of this? Well, we can just construct IQ tests. I like to see this interpretation. This is a kind of IQ test re-engineering. So instead of just thinking about exercises you would put on a, a, an IQ test, just try to generate that from computational pr principles. That's the basic idea. In fact, one of the controversies about IQ tests is when you get a series that you need to complete, some people say, or oh, I could say A or B or C. Why is one answer better than the rest? And there is an answer for that. Because with some continuations of these sequences, the, the series is much more compressible because you follow the pattern. So there's, uh, there's no uh, subjectivity in these exercises. It's not because someone thought that here it should go uh, an L, for instance. It's because it comes an L. From, there's no competing program for getting the same, or not shorter program to get in that, a different answer for that sequence. So while well, we use this test for humans, uh, we evaluated humans and we get that the complexity of the theoretical complexity of the instances correlated very well with the diffic difficulty that uh, in sequences. But of course, this is not a sufficient uh, intelligence test. There are many things. One thing is that our famous Sanghi and Dao program, this Perl program of about 1,000 lines, could pass these tests. So in the end, it's just an IQ test for engineering. There's nothing new except from the way these sequences are, have been uh, generated. And there, these are status series. There, there are much more things here. So at this moment, there was the first worship about in, the, in 2000, there was a first worship on performance of machine intelligence systems. It was the first time there was just a conference or a worship on evaluating machines. As far as I know, probably there was some kind of uh, talk or session inside some, but just uh, a three-day, I think it was a three-day or two-day uh, conference on this. And I was very enthusiastic. I have to go there. So this is the place to go. And I went there. And one of the um, invited speakers was Ade. Remember that he introduced, introduced the notion of MIQ, the machine intelligence quotient. And he said something, or at least he wrote something in the proceeding, something like this, that was quite uh, interesting about his talk. He said, well, realistic metrization of intelligence is not possible within the conceptual structures, existing methods of definitions and measurement. We can accept a concept as complex as intelligence to be definable in traditional terms. Well, I was stubborn. Yeah, 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 yeah. We can. We can. Uh, well, if you say you can, you need to show it. So, well, where am I? Okay. So, well, I tried to factorize the previous ideas. I, I suggested the, the notion of using rewards uh, as in an in, in animal evaluation. And that was the end of the story, at least from my, uh, from my perspective. Some years after that, there was a, a very interesting notion called universal intelligence. And it introduced by Leg and Hutter. This is uh, uh, Leg's uh, thesis. And the idea was to define intelligence as performance over many environments. The idea was using Comoro complexity, algorithmic information theory, yet again, 
And the idea is that you average how an agent performs in a wide variety of environments. Yes, that's appealing, but you have to tell me the distribution, how they choose the environments. All of them, you cannot evaluate the system on every possible environment, every possible life. You have to do the selection. So this selection is here, and it is again, this is common complexity again. In my opinion, this proposal is interesting about because of the use of reinforcement learning, agents, interaction, uh, environments. So these ideas are appealing for intelligent tests. But there are many problems here, I think. Problems about well, not only computability, but many other problems. But the idea is quite appealing. So where are we? Well, machine intelligence, no. Well, this is fascinating, but still discard is are not solution to have any integrative view for all of them. This has not even been recognized as an imperative problem. And certainly, and I can tell that, it's not a mainstream area of research. We are, we are strange people, the people who are working here. Uh, there are not many people. So this is the picture. The picture is that we have this, 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 depending on what you want to measure, you need, you have different approaches. Some approaches work. IQ tests work uh, for humans, but some other approaches don't work. You, we have this at, at this moment. So one question we just raised uh, three years ago is, well, and just getting back to, these, uh, to this area, uh, of research again, can we construct a test for all of them? And let's make our uh, letter to Father Christmas or, and just say, okay, uh, with that knowledge about the examining, you just get the system and you don't get any idea whether it is a human, an animal, or a machine. Uh, derived from computational principles, it has to be well grounded has to be non-biased against uh, any species or no human intervention, automated, producing score or several factors, meaningful, so what we are measuring must be intelligence, practical, and any time. Practical means feasible, and any time is that you can interrupt the test at any time and get a score. And the more time you give the system, the more accuracy you expect from the measurement. Well, would be great, would be great. Well, so we do propose something, not along everything here, but some of them, and we propose uh, something that we call the an anytime universal test. So we use environments, we just try to be discriminative. Not every environment is useful to test intelligence, so we need some, we need some extra properties. And we made the test adaptive, which is an important thing that also appears in psychometrics. There's an area called adaptive uh, testing, where we start with very simple environments and we try to adapt to the system, depending on its capabilities. And, well, it also includes time, which is an important thing for intelligent, and it can be stopped any time. But that was a proposal, the test is just adaptive algorithm, so there are two places where we can we adapt the difficulty of the environments and also the speed of the environments, depending on the system. So we can uh, just test uh, very fast systems and also very slow systems, even if you're not given any information about how fast the uh, system interacts, okay? You can, get, you can just be given a test in microseconds, and you're going to score very, very poorly on that test. So, well, that was a proposal, and the proposal, uh, uh, the proposals are fine uh, unless you try to implement them. When you try to implement them, you find a lot of problems. And, well, that was a project that we, we have been involved in the past three years. It's, it, it, it finished last year. And the goal was try to evaluate the feasibility of this idea, of the notion of uh, at any time test, a universal test. So we try to, we define an environment class 
we uh, used a special difficulty function, and one of the most interesting things about this project is that, uh, the design of human interfaces, or how can we just use this test to apply this test to humans. This is an example of the interface where we, we have some cells. The cells are just connected uh, in a graph, and we have some objects in the graph. There are some patterns that we need to discover. There are some rewards. The rewards are just some green circles, red circles, something you have to tell the, um, the subject before the test. We just did the test with some people. And, well, we did some other uh, prototypes and uh, tests and many experiments. And what we did was to compare humans with an AI algorithm. Very stupid one, which is Q-learning. Very useful one, but we can't say that Q-learning is very intelligent. But it's a very useful and very famous and popular in the area of enforcement learning. In, in artificial intelligence. And when we looked at the scores, the scores were, were fairly similar. So, well, we did more uh, tests, more uh, experiments, and the test is useful to compare humans, for instance. The test is useful to compare Q-learning systems. When you try to compare humans against Q-learning systems, the results are not very satisfying because it is clear that humans are much more intelligent than Q-learning. And these tests don't reflect that. So, well, something's wrong. Um, well, it's an intelligent test based on theoretical principles. You can apply that to humans and machines. That's not too much. But there are many things uh, that we needed to ignore or postpone in order to make uh, an actual test. So, uh, well, this just was a prototype. It was not even adaptive. There was no noise. The pattern had low complexity. There was, uh, we only ch checked one factor. There's no knowledge acquisition needed for the test. And there's no social behavior needed for the test. So all of these things were, weren't included in, in this test. So from here, we can't say that universal tests are impossible. We can't just say that for the moment, nobody has been able to do the notion or implement an, a universal test, a, a universal intelligence test that you can apply to any subject. So before dismissing this idea, we should explore all of this. This, of course, needs a lot of time. Even though there was, uh, there was kind of deception about the specialty experimental results, we got a lot of media coverage. That was impressive, something that... Uh, I, I went sick about this. Uh, about, well, it was a year, it was a nightmare, especially because of this. Look, now new test measures intelligence accurately. Dog versus man. And here, look, extraterrestrial intelligence. Whoa! Look at what we are able to do in our department. No way, no, no way. So, well, instead of hiding uh, under a stone, what uh, we have been uh, trying to do recently is to push a little bit forward and to propose the notion of universal psychometrics. So instead, well, this is this idea of uh, considering any possible system in the same way, under the same principles, under the same computational principles, well, this idea should be explored even though that it seems that it's going to be very, very difficult. But this, this needs to be explored. So something that we know from all of this is that the less we take for granted about the subject, the more difficult it is to evaluate it. So if you know something about the subject, you can customize your tests. But if you don't know anything, then your test must be very general, or at least in the beginning. Then we, you can adapt to that. That's the reason why uh, interviews are useful, because or the Turing test has something uh, positive here, because you have to the yeah, uh, subject is, is given. You, you try to that. The judges adapt to the, uh, to the uh, subject. But still, this is a negative uh, thing against this, but there's another thing. We want to evaluate machine intelligence. 
animal intelligence is another thing, and human intelligence, and a lot of people doing this and doing this great. So why we should generalize this? Well, why we try to solve a more general problem when we need to solve a more specific problem? Well, and the answer is that the actual problem is a general problem. That's the answer. So animals and humans are inside what we call the machine kingdom. There's nothing new here for some people who believe in the church, uh, church to in thesis, and but this is a thesis, not a, a theorem. So, well, but think about animates. What's an animate? Probably you haven't heard about that term, but it's just um, a robot acting as an animal. And there are many animates just acting as an ant, as a spider, and things like that, or even as a rat. And they are achieving, they are getting closer and closer. What about hybrids? Just a human enhanced by a computer. Where do we put them? What about collectives? If we just put a group and we put a human and a machine inside, which tool are we going to use? An IQ test or a test from machine intelligence measurement? So let's take a look at this, which is, I repeat, is nothing special, nothing new. But we just consider that the machine kingdom is a superset of the animal kingdom, which in, uh, again is a superset of Homo sapiens. So just taking a look at this, we just define universal psychometrics as, well, as an area trying to evaluate intelligence or more generally connective abilities of subjects inside this set, which is the most general set that we can conceive. This is what we call universal psychometrics. What elements should be there? Well, when we talk about subjects and cognitive Subjects are any physically computable interactive system. And you can consider you one of them. Okay? So you are here. You are a subject. What are cognitive tasks? Tasks are physically computable interactive systems. Of course, we could consider idealistic systems with no resources, no resource limits. But we are just considering resource-bounded uh, systems for subjects and tasks. Task is a problem. Interfaces. Again, we need interfaces and we need the notion of reward for any system. If you don't know a valid reward for a system, you cannot evaluate that system. If you're not able to put you on a table to write an IQ test, I won't be able to evaluate your intelligence. And this is also the same for animals, and this should also be the same for machines. Of course, we can have tasks, but we need to define which tasks, what are we going to measure? And there's an important thing here. We are not interested in worst case performance, but average case performance. And this is something that people working in, in computational complexity will, will uh, or com uh, computer, even computer programming will easily recognize that it's a different thing. We are not interested in classes of problems and solving all the problems, but how they do perform on average. And one interesting concept is that difficulty has to be defined in computational terms, in formal terms, mathematical terms, not because they compare, because you cannot talk about species in the Russian kingdom. You cannot talk about that. Populations. What's a population about machines? You can talk about the population of humans or even species, but not for machines. You cannot talk, well, this is a model of machines, a series. You can compare this series of machines with a different series. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, so many of the things come from psychometrics, from comparative cognition, animal evaluation, but some others come from algorithm information. And I think at this, the use of all these ideas from different fields that could be, could be productive. So we have to dismiss this. So intelligence cannot be what intelligence tests measure. We don't accept these kind of recurrent definitions. We need to go to the, to the foundations of this. So, well, we need to define everything in terms of computational terms. Um, one thing that could be uh, distinctive to, for instance, um, uh, 
uh, psychometrics, and psychometrics you can relate many factors and then a lot of factor analysis between. Is it inductive inference related to, let's say, language, for instance, in humans? Yes, no. What about these kind of animals? Is the, are these two uh, abilities together? Can they come together? Well, for this animal they come, but for this different animal they don't come. And what about computers? Well, we can analyze whether, those, whether there's a relation between two abilities, theoretically. This has been done partially, but not with the goal of evaluating machines. So, well, I understand the strong objections are understandable, uh, especially because of the failure of the past 60 years. So, well, this is just a proposal, an idea. I think this is a point of view rather than just a, a strong proposal. So, well, I, I would like to uh, finish this talk uh, with, well, what's beyond the current moment? I would I, I like to call this the that we need to explore the machine kingdom in the same way we're exploring the animal kingdom. So there are many, and there will be many machines out there that we will need to explore, to assess, to categorize independently of who created them, what was the, pu the purpose of that machine, and there will be there, and we will need to evaluate them. So there's a, a huge space for exploration. So I think this is uh, quite appealing. And, well, the answer is of this talk that, of course, intelligence measurement is still an open problem. Probably after all of this, you can say, whoa, this is much more difficult than I thought in the beginning. This is already needed in some applications today, and this is becoming more and more needed in the future. Just think about how many different systems we are going to deal with in the future. Uh, I don't know if you have heard about the technology called singularity. Well, there's a lot of things behind this term, but it typically refers to the moment in which uh, technology reaches the point where a machine is able to construct a smarter machine than itself. And this means that uh, technology is going to uh, be boosted exponentially. But you can believe this or not, okay? But this is the term or what you can find behind the term technological singularity. There's a lot of blah, blah, blah behind this as well. And, well, the exploration of this, let's call just machines, uh, is dual to the exploration of the cognitive abilities. And this is, has also been realized in some areas, such as uh, uh, animal intelligence evaluation. And this is, has a parallel with theory of computation. Of course, we are talking about computation principles, so many, many things there should be useful. So we know this parallel between problem classes and automata classes, the problem and the solver. And we have classes for the problems and classes for the solvers. So this is more or less the same parallelism. But typically here, we're talking about individuals, about classes. Well, so, and this is my final slide. Um, we had a motivation, I don't know, or I had a motivation or before we started with this story. Our motivation was to develop or to see uh, whether there are tests of machine intelligence. And I hope that, or at least in my case this is so, I think that this has been strengthened. We need these kind of tools. But I would say that it has, this has been refined as well. So, uh, in my opinion, we need accurate, non-anthropocentric, meaningful, sorry, and computational ways of evaluating the progress of artificial intelligence. And I would say more. I would say that the evaluation of machine intelligence cannot be seen about, well, let's look at a very narrow point of view of machines. Let's look at the big picture. And let's put everything together and try to find uh, measurements for any kind of system. So looking at this problem as a very general problem, as a problem of understanding what intelligence is, which is the big question. Okay? 
And let me just finish with the last paragraph of 1950 Turing's paper, which says we can only see a short distance ahead, but we can see plenty there that needs to be done. Okay, thank you very much. Come on. <laughs> Is it everything clear? I can't believe it. I, 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 it's not clear for me, so. <laughs> not even a science fiction question, which is a typical question here. What about Skynet and the future of humanity and all of that? What is a person? Should we give? Yeah, we have a question there. Yeah, if I say something, I'm going to be wrong. But uh, I don't know, perhaps half a century. Some people say 20, 30 years, but I would say that. Well, it depends on making your, your evaluation more precise. Or, since we don't have measurements, I cannot say, okay, if you say, we, we, if we had one good measurement, how, when do you expect to reach this level or this score at this stage? I could give an answer, but that's. I could give an, opi an opinion, not an answer to that, of course. But, well, I think this is about that. In a moment that we can think that, well, they're becoming uh, closer than, especially about natural language and things like that, which I think is one of the um, social abilities, which I think that, that computers are still struggling a lot. But it's just a guess. Probably, probably it's going to be sooner or after <laughs> that. Yeah, uh, my opinion, I, I think we cannot separate the, what the notion of intelligence is what the measurements of intelligence. I think these two things have to, to come together. In fact, if you're able to create a good intelligence test, you are able to define intelligence as a result of these tests. But this doesn't mean a lot because you have IQ tests, a work, and you say intelligence is what IQ tests measure, and you haven't answered the question of what intelligence is. But at least you have a definition. And I think if you go, the good thing about uh, looking for computational approaches to the notion of intelligence and intelligence measurement is that you know what you're doing. You're not just picking your questions from there and there. Oh, this question works, so let's put it in the test. This, work, this question doesn't work, so let's remove it. You're not working in that way. You're just saying, this is the class of problems that I want to put in the test. I just have a distribution, and from that distribution, and from that you can give a definition, whether it is a good definition or not. But I think you can give something formal, something that can be analyzed, and you can... And that's the reason why the proposals are just dismissed so fast. Whenever you try to do something, and, oh, look at that, this, can't be, this is wrong, because you can look at that. In IQ tests, you can... Mm, <laughs> they work. <laughs> That's the thing they have. So, but I think that, well, the problem is, is the, big, the big question is to define what intelligence is, to give a formal definition, because we have many informal definitions for that. And I think the definition must be computational. This is my, my opinion. It has to be mathematical, it has to be computational. It, it's information processing. This is my point of view. So there must be some way to define intelligence.
that's a very good question. That's a very good question. Yeah, 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 no, 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 very, very good question. Um, uh, some of the things that we have been working recently is the evaluation of social intelligence. And I will come to your question in a moment. But the evaluation of social intelligence as well, if your environments are empty, there are no other agents in your environment when you're trying to do intelligence tests. It is uh, very difficult that you can evaluate social abilities, for instance. And what about if you're playing tests? You're playing tests against someone. So it is the intelligence of your opponent that counts. So if you're playing tests against a very bad player, your results are going to be very good. So what about if we try to measure intelligence? So, well, in some way, uh, when we are talking about an adaptive test, we try to make it uh, automated because we try to adapt to the intelligence and try to find what's in uh, the environment that I can just use as the next question for that subject that is going to be more informative. So in order to make the, the test shorter. This is something that when you find an uh, you meet a new person, you do a question, and from that question you think about another question, and you try to adapt your questions in order to get the information you like. Oh, is this person stupid? Oh, he's brilliant. You, you can get that in, in a few questions because you are intelligent, you're able to find the good questions that you need to do. And that's the good thing about the Turing test. The problem about the Turing test is that we need a human. So in some cases, we say that some of the things that we have found in, in not, not me, but in general, in, in psychometrics, there that some tasks, there are some very brilliant people who perform very bad, very poorly on these tasks. And for measuring intelligence, probably uh, the intelligence of higher degree, degrees of intelligence cannot be properly perceived by some other agents with lower intelligence. I'm coming to your question. I guess that a very intelligent uh, system or being will be, will be able to evaluate the intelligence of other much more quickly. And evaluating higher intelligence should be more difficult because you have to figure out more uh, difficult environments. In any case, for some abilities, I think that this can be automated and possible. For instance, for some inductive inference abilities. This is a very good question, a very difficult one. And it's related to many, to many things, to social intelligence and I cannot answer that question. I'll just give an opinion. I think that, well, as in every uh, technology, there are some kind of uh, hot topics, fashions, and things like that. And I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare to say the the what's a hot topic in artificial intelligence. But occasionally, there's some funding on some area, and you leave some other area more uh, behind for mainstream research. And I think that in artificial intelligence, they were very, very enthusiastic in the first years about constructing general intelligent machines. That was the goal in the 50s and the 60s. And they was like, oh, this is, this is not working. So let's try to solve specific problems, useful problems, what the industry wants, and all of that. And I think that it hasn't changed a lot in the past 60, 50 years or so. So typically, artificial intelligence is more concerned about solving problems that are useful for people instead of the original problem. But well, I don't know if, whether this is good or bad, but typically science has to be focused uh, not always on the big questions, but also on practical issues and solving people's problems. But it will come sooner or later. Of course, if we could have a lot of money invested in developing uh, truly uh, intelligent machines, this would arrive earlier. But perhaps there are more important things. I, I don't know. I don't know if this answers your question.
I think that the computational model and, and other models of computation have been, have been at stake many times. Um, some people say that for intelligence we need an, a different model of computation. I'm not in that opinion. I think it's an algorithm problem. I think that with the current, uh, but this is just an opinion. I think that with, with our current model of computation, this problem can be solved. I think this is, I think I, I, I will just repeat that. I think that intelligence is just information processing with our, our Turing machines that we know. It. I, think, I think this is what I think. I, I think we don't need quantum computing and things like that. That would be great if they can power or boost our capabilities in the future. But I think this is not the answer.